I waited for some four or so months, sleeping on a friend's couch in Buenos Aires. After leaving the Falkland Islands, with no explanations. Whilst the government of Christianity occurred to decide how and when they would give me papers. I had been offered help as well to find work in a country where work was hard to come by, if I just agreed to a little bit of publicity, as I said. I was the only island-born resident in 30 years to ask for citizenship. That then became international news as I received my national identity document from the then president in front of the world's media on the same day that Britain had forced the surrender of Argentina back in 1982. I assumed it was a little bit of revenge for losing the war. British media accused me of giving up my British passport, which was a lie. Argentine media called me a hero and in favour of the Argentine side of history. It wasn't like that either. I received threats as well as requests for interviews and mail from around the globe. British Prime Minister David Cameron said that one man didn't change anything regarding the situation over the islands. The Argentine Foreign Minister, speaking at the United Nations, said they were taking the well-being of the new citizen very seriously regarding the threats I'd received. I really didn't care too much for either opinion. I was mostly called a traitor. I wouldn't play down the level of emotions, but the date, which had been the worst part, had been the Argentine government's doing. Again, trying to survive in the world of others, which uses symbolism. I'd burned a bridge, yet at the same time I didn't care. I was a father too. The conversation between right and wrong became kind of muted. Worse, I think, is when we don't take any decision. When you believe in something, the past is suddenly unrecognizable. Consequences don't exist. I also remembered a close friend at the time, the former Argentine conscript, as we talked of how I could possibly take advantage of things, the publicity, the contacts, the public figure that I'd apparently become. But I really just wanted to sleep in the same house as my sons again. In 2016, I'd featured in an Argentine documentary, which called me an exile. I hadn't been back to the islands or seen half my family in five years. I'd remained in Argentina, working in the National Archives, before one day I just picked up my coat and walked out. I felt empty, I felt a cheat, I felt like an imposter. I didn't even feel like I was in my own body. Of course, I live near my children, sure, and I tried to fix my relationship, but in such a setting, and with such outer pressures, it was toxic. I was clinging to something purely as a means to survive, not because I believed in it. As Ronaldo Reynas writes, the exile is a person who, having lost a loved one, keeps searching for the face he loves in every new face, and forever deceiving himself, thinks he has found it. Just like the title traitor being an exile also annoyed me, five years after taking citizenship, I went back to the Falklands, where my brother and sisters and a few close friends remained. As Oscar Wilde says, a community is infinitely more brutalized by the habitual employment of punishment than it is by the occasional occurrence of crime. In 1996, I made my first show in Buenos Aires. I knew I'd been making some sort of declaration as no one went to Argentina from the islands following the war. Argentines were also banned from entering the islands. My father accepted it and a few close friends. Mostly the small community in the islands didn't. Neither did the British representation in Argentina. I was virtually in a no man's land. The curator of my first show, in 1996, said that I was like some artist of the 19th century, drifting apart from the small community in the islands. 
I think I was in some studio in Buenos Aires, amid the noise and the people, the beat of the city. I still have boarded my windows up and spoken to very few. I won't assume everyone knows where the islands are, but just to say they're some 400 miles off the coast of South America, down at the bottom. The shoreline's covered with the remains of ships trying to round the horn in the 19th century, and then a war 150 years later between Britain and Argentina that left nearly a thousand people dead. If you had ever been there, it's kind of like the last place in the world you imagine a war happening. Like Borges called it, two bald men fighting over a kind. The poet makes himself a seer by a long, prodigious and rational disordering of all the senses. Every form of love, of suffering, of madness, he searches himself. And even if, crazed, he ends up by losing the understanding of his visions, at least he has seen them. Let him die charging through those unutterable, unnameable things. Other horrible workers will come. They will begin from the horizons where he has succumbed. Perhaps what made me want to travel was the exile part, having that label. Or maybe it was just the random social media bullshit by people who really had nothing to do with the whole issue, apart from having an opinion. The usual political associations and photographs of the Falklands or the Malvinas, just to boost their own ideas of self-worth. You're really coming home, my older sister wrote. That's great, she said. I was thinking all the time that she might say the opposite, because she'd be worried for me and for what other people would think. As for considering the pros and cons politically, then I was just showing the possibilities and the limitations anyway. The international community considered the islands an ongoing issue. It had two names and it had two different arguments, two different passports yet with only one place of birth, geographical dislocation as it were, both personally and politically. I had two passports only because there didn't exist one for people like me. There is a child inside all of us, and sometimes it's dangerous to go with that inquisitive nature, rather than the usual cynicism or a falseness covering up a more vulnerable disposition. But I think if we all stumble on some way of killing the ego, or they're killing the self, then we do find our true state. Of course, you have to ask yourself what is wrong, too. Maybe nothing is wrong. I think in the end it's what you become after the event that counts. My clothes felt worn and dust covered, my shoes like my father's oversized trainers, as a child they cut my feet, my coat is as small I pulled the zip up tight, but still I felt the cold. Is this what I can blame, a smile that can never be mine, that's someone else's? My boxes shall remain closed, my requirements like ornaments and artifacts are not display or need, 
for I'm not that man anymore, except in the shadows I shall catch a glimpse. These darkest parts I shed like skin, a form that has since been copied, its details the missing parts that others see clearly, but not me. We cannot be honest, for we die living a lie, surrounded by myths, and poor myths at that, created out of misconceptions and incidentals, the truth, and there's a game not fit to be played by grown-ups, that we wish we'd covered up, or that we swore we would reveal when it came the right time to do so. Or is there beneath this doubt, I swear, that hangs ready and waiting? Is there a realisation once declared, that comes with being free? That there's no freedom really without sacrifice, and there is no turning back when you finally know your colours to the sound of friends calling, who are not friends, but merely the inquisitive. I remember arriving to London as a 21-year-old student to Chelsea School of Art and the officers of the British Council, who were used to attending students from the warm bits of the globe. Parts of Britain's far-reaching were dwindling empire. The air had been given £300 to buy some materials and cold-weather clothing. I'd spend it on a guitar by lunchtime. In the end, their education is something we decide on ourselves, though our eyes and ears are opened by the smallest of details too. Just like they say that it must be where we're from that makes us who we are. But I don't think our setting is necessarily responsible for what we become. I think it's up to the individual to keep that search going, regardless of your background. I told another journalist recently that what I was doing in my work was like a search for intimacy. I then told him about the story of my mother and her Argentine boyfriend, about how he was put on a ship days after the surrender and she didn't see him again for 25 years. As John Berger describes in his novel G on the search for intimacy, both sexually and historically speaking, these things are only understood over time Authenticity has always been a guide. The music I listened to when growing up and getting to London to art school, the traditions of English romanticism, lyricism, rebellion, critiques, attention to style, the unpretentious attention to rough details even, the sort of fuck you mentality. I listened recently to a talk given by Malcolm McLaren, former manager of the Sex Pistols, about authenticity, or as he said, how to be a magnificent failure. One has to do it with a bit of style. I wasn't sure how I could finish the filming to take back and show the boys. Shax would have said that for it to be hard, you had to take yourself out of it. It felt like putting my home in a box. And Jacques was right too. I just made something about going home. Sometimes art just gets in the way. When I began writing, back in Puerto Madre in 2004, I had an idea of what I wanted to do, but things change. Parts begin to have a life of their own, and just like painting, it's important that you let it take you someplace. Otherwise, why do it? You didn't say where? No, I didn't. You don't even have an excuse, Terry? No, I don't. I watched as my parents faced off across the room, my father's hands resting on his hips as he breathed heavily, his index finger bent from a rugby injury, and my mother waiting with a coat by the door. Are you coming? My mother said, looking at me. I looked at my father, then back to my mother, 
then to the schoolwork again counting. 30 days of September, April, June and why don't you just fuck off, shouted my father to my mother. As you can see, he doesn't want to go. Much as it went like that, my parents' final conversation, their mismatch of a union coming to an end. I wonder what started at this time, said my grandmother, like nothing would surprise her if she knew, as my father called to complete the apologising part, the high ceiling rooms of the police house with a permanent echo, after everyone had left. Perhaps Maria L's family don't live like this, I thought, the weeks turning into months as my father began to drink, his words of comfort to a ten-year-old that no one liked coming home to an empty house. Sensibilities once pricked remain forever alert, they say, the colibri arriving one day in the porch at the front of the house, the coloured shiny plumage of a hummingbird blown off course from the South American mainland, its velvet shine brilliant against the drab surroundings as it hovered where my sister's and mother's bags had been.